Good day. Welcome to the CAF Web Talk, Why is Hamas so popular? I'm Andrea Spindle, Executive Director of the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, a registered charitable organization that is entirely volunteer driven and for over 20 years has tirelessly aimed at educating and raising awareness among Jews and non-Jews to the increasing anti-Semitism brewing in our Western democracies. Committed from the outset to interfaith relations, CAF has welcomed alliances with Christian Zionists, with Iranian and Chinese dissidents, with persecuted minorities such as the Yazidis and the Kurds, and with moderate Muslims who oppose the Islamists who want to put a stranglehold on our liberties. We are reaching out now to Hindu communities, Afro-Canadians, and others who stand for the values we cherish, such as freedom of religion, expression, and association, and who don't see supporting diversity and inclusion as pursuing equitable outcomes, but rather supporting equality of opportunity. In order to produce resources such as the CAF website, our educational materials and webinars, as well as to conduct specific research projects, organize direct action and build advocacy campaigns, we do need your financial support. Please consider making a gift online at www.caef.ca. I'd like to thank the following organizations for being promotional partners for today's program. The Ludger Center Congregation, Canadian Institute for Jewish Research, the New Hampshire for Israel Organization, International Christian Embassy Jerusalem in Canada, the Israel Activist Calendar, Matatias Project, Liberate Art, Club Z, Doctors Against Racism and Antisemitism, Americans for Safe Israel, the Israel Committee of Sonoma County, and Jew Hatred Canada, and Astarta. The greatest contributor to anti-Semitism in the current era is anti-Israelism or anti-Zionism. The notion that Israel is the source of all evil, that peace will come if Israel would just agree to be eliminated and Jews will simply leave the Middle East and be forever minority peoples in the diaspora, subject to whatever vagaries await them, as has been the case for Jews for thousands of years. The pro-Palestinian protesters say that a strong Israel is a threat to peace, and Jews who originated in Judea are, are interlopers and occupiers. The narrative of our enemies who are portrayed as pro-Palestinian, when essentially they're only Jew haters and have nothing at all to address in terms of the needs and rights of Palestinian Arabs, is that Israel is committing ethnic cleansing, which is contrary to the facts as the Arab population has grown significantly since 1948, and only in the Middle East with a vibrant is there a vibrant, growing Christian population in Israel? Facts don't matter to Jew haters on the left or right among Islamists, black supremacists, or other bigots. But how can we understand that so-called progressives turn away from the horrors committed by Hamas, not only against Jews and foreign nationals, but against Arabs and other Muslims, against their own people? On October 7th, 20 Arabs were massacred, as well as the village and uh, Bedouin com community lost 19 people. In Gaza, civilians have been denied freedom to leave. Humanitarian supplies have been warehoused by Hamas and not distributed. Opponents to the regime are shot and children are used as human shields. Despite all the evidence that for decades, donor funds from Western governments did not build infrastructure, housing or employment, but did build miles and miles of tunnels and weapons factories, and over 200 children died in building the tunnels, and that many misfired rockets account for about a quarter of the deaths in Gaza. Why is Hamas so popular? To address this question, I'm very pleased to introduce Aaron Sheshan, whom I had the pleasure to meet in person a few years ago when he was in Toronto conducting a study for the Right Group. Today, Aaron is the founder and CEO of a startup, a small, small social benefit organization in Israel focused on national resilience and social cohesion. From 2017 to 2023, he was CEO of the Right Group, Israel's leading think tank. And previous to that, he was co-leader of an international business diplomacy firm, then headed its worldwide Israel office. Aaron is a board member for various Israeli nonprofits and companies, He's an alumnus of the U.S. State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program. He frequently speaks at international conferences, and he contributes to Israeli and international media, including Newsweek, The New York Times, and NPR. He holds an MBA 
in International Management, an MA in Middle East Studies, and a BA in International Relations from the Hebrew University. He's also a marathon runner and featured in a documentary about his search for Holocaust impacted relatives. Aaron will now address us, after which he'd be happy to take questions. And so I ask the audience to please use the Q&A function on Zoom if you have a question. If you want to um, make comments in the chat, please feel free to do so. Just please be respectful. Thanks everyone for joining us today and welcome, Aaron. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to, to be here. Um, I'll start, uh, you know, on October 7th, Hamas launched a surprising attack against uh, Israel, which included mass murder of innocent civilians in their homes, indiscriminate violence towards women, the elderly and children, mass kidnapping of Israeli citizens, and many reported cases of, uh, of rape. The extent of atrocities committed by Hamas is, is really beyond imagination. Entire families were wiped out. Um, whole communities reduced to ashes. Infants massacred. More than 1,200 Israelis were slaughtered. It's impossible to overstate the damage caused by these events. But despite these atrocities and despite Hamas designation as a terrorist organization by the US, Canada, and the EU, and several other countries, several progressive movements continue to embrace Hamas. Meanwhile, the initial sympathy for Hamas quickly morphs now into criticism and steep rise of, of anti-Semitism. Um, today, this morning, I issued a, a newsletter. Uh, and in it, I've mentioned a Canadian friend of mine that requested to display a menorah at the University of Alberta, but faced a bizarre decision by the university to remove all Christmas tree from campus instead. Now, this story, you probably you know, heard about it. This story made it to international news. Uh, a different friend of mine, a university professor also in Toronto, told me that her union is participating in a labor against apartheid campaign organized by a group that is known for its uh, sympathizers, uh, sympathizers of Hamas. Now, these events are connected. But how could this inversion of morality unfold? How could this happen? So I will try the next few minutes to uh, give you my take on, uh, on that. The easiest explanation to this is anti-Semitism. Now, while anti-Semitism clearly plays a major role, it also oversimplifies the issue of anti-Semitism because it makes it feel intractable. However, if we understand the dynamics that enabling this modern revival of anti-Semitism, we can craft strategies to counter it because this presentation is not just about describing the problem. I really want to highlight the opportunities for, for action. Now, the support for Hamas and the current rise of anti-Semitism both connect to academ academic theories, social phenomena, and politics. And I want to start with the rise of identity politics and critical race theory and the evolution of diversity, equity, and inclusion policies known as uh, DEI. Uh, to summarize, critical race theory is an academic framework focused on the intersection between race, ethnicity, gender, origin, and social power structure. It assumes that systemic racism is deeply embedded in the legal and political frameworks. This uh, theory divides society into binary categories, oppressors versus oppressed. Often the categorization is based solely on a skin color. A key concept in critical race theory is intersectionality. This is an academic theory that turned the organizing logic. It draws parallels between different, form of, different uh, forms of oppression uh, attributed to the oppressive white establishment, white and, and male establishment. It encourages minority groups to collaborate against this white establishment. Intersectionality led to an increased collaboration between different minorities, black movements like uh, Black Lives Matter with LGBTQ uh, groups, with Latinos, feminist organization, and so on and so forth. Now, in a way, this dynamic reminds us of the civil rights movement in America of more than 50 years ago. At the time, Jews were an integral part and even a leading part of the civil rights movement in America, collaborating with black movements. I'm sure, uh, if not all of you, uh, probably uh, many of you, are familiar with the famous walk to Selma with Martin Luther King and Rabbi Heschel. But today, Jews are absent from intersectional spaces unless they, are, unless they are willing to leave Zionism at the door. And one may ask, where are the Jews 
as a vulnerable minority in this coalition, especially in light of the rise of anti-Semitism? And the answer is that in these progressives, progressive narratives, North American Jews are frequently framed as white privileged oppressors. And this framing fails to capture the unique Jewish experience. So this perception of Jews as whites lead to what, when I was leading the Reut Institute, we called it the Jewish erasure, namely the discrimination and bias, which is not necessarily based on hate, but is based on the perception of Jews as whites. For example, um, you, most of you live in Canada and the US, and you probably would agree that there's some kind of an erosion sense of urgency in the fight against anti-Semitism in the mainstream in Canada and in the US. Anti-Semitism is increasingly perceived as a rich people's problem. So it can't be that bad because we are all white. Now, you meet the Jewish erasure and you may not even be aware of that. A Jewish erasure is when the union of my Canadian friend that I've uh, mentioned allows itself to participate in a labor against apartheid event, implicitly supporting Hamas while ignoring that there are certainly a number of Jews in the organization other than my friend. But such act is reasonable in their eyes because of their, the privilege of, of, the, uh, of the, the Jewish members. Jewish erasure is when basic Jewish symbols like the menorah are perceived as a provocative nationalist act, which caused the University of Alberta to simply ignore my friend's request to place the menorah on campus. Uh, he decided to ban all religious symbols uh, on its territory in order not to confront uh, this issue. And it is expressed, as you all know, uh, in the fact that the presidents of Ivy League universities think that statements calling for the genocide of Jews shouldn't be categorically banned, as they depend on the context. The Jewish erasure is when diversity, equity, and inclusion policies are introduced to even K-12 curriculum in the U.S. I'm not sure about the situation in Canada, but in the U.S. they are part now of K-12, and they include framing of Israel as a colonial state, because Israel is a white state, right? So another spec that is worth dedicating uh, you know, a different webinar to is that all of this is being funded by uh, uh, Qatar. And that has introduced a moral bias in academia and made it structural. I will not elaborate on this, but Qatar and other foreign agents play a very uh, an important major role in this. At this point, if not in the beginning or when you saw the invitation, I'm sure that uh, some of you had asked themselves, why would an Israeli like me, with a slight accent, I'm sure you will agree, why am I lecturing you about a phenomenon that, that is intrinsically yours? And the reason is that critical race, theory, critical race theory has increasingly influenced the framing of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And in this uh, binary oppressed versus oppressors, Israel is portrayed as the oppressor. Now, this distortion then enables progressive tolerance of Hamas atrocities and framing it as resistance rather than uh, terrorism, even, even following October 7th. Since Jews are framed as white, then the Jewish state is, of course, a white state. And if it's white, it's therefore colonial. So the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is framed as a struggle between white privileged oppressors versus oppressed brown Palestinians. Now, this simplistic binary view fails to recognize not only the unique historical and geopolitical circumstances of Israel, but also its current demographic composition. You probably know that Israel is not all Ashkenazis, right? Most Israeli Jews are non-white, Mizrahi, Ethiopian, Central Asians, or other descent. Um, and this is all, and I should, of course, make a very important reservation, that this is an opportunity to mention that even if it was the case that there was a majority of Ashkenazi, why does not mean, why does not mean evil, right? So we should, you know, reject this uh, framework to start with, but uh, if, if, if we argue that Israel is definitely not, uh, the, comp the demographic composition is definitely not white. Hamas is often portrayed as a freedom fighter organization of oppressed brown people. Yes, you heard right. Hamas is an organization of brown people. You should look up at progressive literature and, and op-eds. This is how Hamas is framed. The progressive discourse draws parallels between the structural discrimi discrimination faced by African-Americans and the struggle of the Palestinians. This comparison 
often made by anti-Zionist groups, seek to associate Israel with the former apartheid regime in South Africa. Such a framework, of course, fails to acknowledge the genocidal character of Hamas. Now, this ideology frames Hamas terrorists as a freedom fighter and casts them as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Namely, even moderate Palestinians, I wonder if there is such a thing following October 7th, are being uh, undermined by this, uh, by this framework. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Now, if you were able to overcome my uh, slight accent, maybe you better now uh, understand why Israel and Jews have lost support among uh, North American minority groups and why, why is Hamas is, you know, is relatively popular. But what remains puzzling is why Israel garners such disproportionate activism. Why does my Canadian friend's union protest Israeli apartheid, yet stay silent on China, Russia, or even Iran's uh, atrocities? Clearly, there's nothing to compare between Israel and those fortresses of human rights. Uh, but that absurd make my question echo even louder. And the answer lies in, in a social phenomena, which is called the Red-Green Alliance. Uh, this social phenomena uh, describes powerful coalitions between radical leftists and Islamists in the West. This phenomena originated in Europe, but has been migrating to North America, to Canada first, and then gradually to the US. I think that you in Canada prob are probably familiar with this uh, uh, years before the US. Now, the, uh, the colors, red refers to radical socialists, and green symbolizes Islamism. I know that... Uh, Colors mean different things in different places, so this is why I stress it. Now, despite the divergent ideologies, these unlikely bedfellows discovered shared interests, particularly in regards to Israel. When you think about it, seemingly there's nothing in common between these two streams, right? When you think about gender issues, the role of religion, and yet they collaborate together. Now, this is not an a ad hoc tactical collaboration. In Europe, leftist intellectuals have worked hard to frame Muslim immigrants as oppressed as the new proletariat class, while Islamist, Islamist uh, clerks issue decrees, or in Arabic fatwas, approving the collaboration with the secular left. So this is not just an ad, a ad hoc uh, uh, collaboration. Now, this framework travel across the Atlantic, and in Toronto, you should be familiar with it uh, very well. Uh, in the US, it was evident as of 2014. Clearly, it, it existed beforehand, but I think that it was translated into a meaningful political force in 2014. Uh, we saw it in the slogans of uh, uh, Islamist organizations uh, uh, from Ferguson to Palestine during the Ferguson riots. American Islamist organizations, some linked to the Muslim Brotherhood, rebranded themselves as progressives fighting for social justice. This is, by the way, a phenomena that we have not seen in Europe. This is very, very North American uh, phenomena. Groups like uh, CARE, C-A-I-R, previously accused of financing terrorism, now lead Black Lives Matter campaigns and champion social causes like minimum wage salary. A uh, process of progressivization, we, we called it. Um, to those who don't know, uh, by the way, Hamas uh, was born as a Gazan branch of the Muslim Brotherhood movement. So, uh, so you now understand the connection. The Red Green Alliance advances anti-Western, anti-Zionist agenda, and of course, several factors have boosted its uh, successful uh, uh, recently. One is the whitewashing of political Islam. Uh, Islamist organizations uh, in the world, in the West, associated with the Muslim Brotherhood have adaptively rebranded themselves as representing political Islam, distinct from the radicalism of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Actually, there is even a doctrine in London, not your London, the London uh, in, in, uh, in, in Britain. It's called Lambertism uh, Doctrine. Lambert, Robert Lambert was a police officer in, uh, in London, and he promoted the idea that by engaging Muslim Brotherhood organization, we will be able to fight better Al-Qaeda and ISIS. So that has gave a kosher stamp, or better say a halal stamp, to, uh, uh, to Islamist and, uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood organization. Uh, the second uh, that, uh, that boosts this, uh, the, the Red Green Alliance is what I call racism of low expectations. 
anti-Semitic rhetoric from Islamists faces very little pushback under the banner of resisting oppression. So you can see that even the most horrendous statements are being uh, forgiven. Uh, the term Islamophobia is used in order to prevent any type of, uh, of criticism. <clears throat> and as I said, in practice, it reflects racism of low expectations from this minority when it comes, of course, to anti-Semitism. Uh, the third element is gaining political power. Islamist organizations in uh, North America have emerged uh, openly sympathetic to Hamas and working closely with the progressive wing of the Democratic Party in the US. Uh, and, they and they openly lobby their, their causes. Uh, Congresswomen, women such as uh, Rashida Talib and Ilhan Omar often participate in events associated with organizations that are known for their sympathy for Hamas. Clearly, there's no legal connection. <coughs> and, and those congresswomen, along with other uh, strange bedfellows, have influenced the discourse within the Democratic Party uh, on Israel. The fourth, I've already mentioned it, is the backing of Qatar. Qatar provides platforms, funds, and logistical supports to amplify the red wind voices. To some extent, Turkey, but clearly the heavyweight uh, actor here is, is Qatar. Uh, and it is, funding, the, it is funding from Qatar to universities in the West that has been keen promoting the framework of critical race theory and DEI uh, policies. There is more to that, uh, but I don't want to, to exhaust you. So, so the combination between the rise of identity politics and the Red Green Alliance generated a selective blindness towards Hamas violence even following the October 7th. It often puts Israel and Hamas on equal standing. And this is at the best case scenario. The worst case scenario, we know that it is uh, an all-out support for, uh, for Hamas. And as we saw in the case of my couple of Canadian friends, anti-Semitism is resurfacing in revised forms with escalating tolerance uh, for attacks on Jews and erasure of Jewish voices, symbols, and bodies from the public square, as well as downplaying Jewish fears surrounding anti-Semitism and dismissing Jewish narratives. Again, anti-Semitism is perceived as a problem of the rich. There's no real sense of urgency around it. <clears throat> in this um, dark, uh, uh, dark times, I also want to highlight the opportunities. Uh, because talking of the problem is uh, talking on the problem is not a problem. And this dynamic I was talking about constitutes threats also to Western democracies. So we are not alone. More increasingly, more people understand the problems with critical race theory. Anti-Semitism corrodes the very social fabric binding diverse societies. <clears throat> Many entities propelling critical race theory are, ho are hostile towards the West itself. I mentioned the Islamist organizations and, and clearly there's an abundance of them. Strange bedfellows of far left factions and Islamist movements exploit progressive language to mainstream their uh, radicalism. So, so we are not alone. We have allies outside uh, the Jewish community. The recent war in Israel was more than another clash between Israel and Hamas or between Israel and Gaza. It exacerbated the challenge of anti-Semitism and delegitimization, no doubt. But it also creates uh, opening for progress. And I'll give you several uh, examples. The first, there's a widening rift among progressives. Despite everything that I've just said about the progressive discourse, not everyone on the left remains supportive of Hamas following October 7th. The brutality of, ha of the Hamas pogrom prompts re-evaluation, or as we say, Hezbon Nefesh, among many progressives. <laughs> and we should utilize this, uh, this trend. Second is the particular awakening of many progressive Jews. Many progressive Jews now recognize things that they were not willing to recognize be beforehand, primarily the double standard that is applied to Israel and to the Jews. Jewish groups failing to differentiate between deliberate child murders and unavoidable collateral damage in wars we lose credibility and supporters within the Jewish community, I have no doubt. Um, the third opportunity that I see is that is uh, framing is attention to the Jewish erasure. Again, the Jewish erasure are the consequences or the bias and discrimination that result from the framing of Jews as white, 
framing Jews as privileged whites was not framed as a threat by Jewish organization. Now increasingly it is. Because the framing of Jews as white is not anti-Semitism. It's not delegitimization. Seemingly it's a, you know, it's just a framework that is being utilized by, uh, in, a, in a certain discourse. But as I was trying to convince, there's a direct correlation between the makeup of this discourse and the rise of anti-Semitism from across the political spectrum. The fourth are potential allies, uh, prominent Arab Muslim voices all across America denounced the sadistic killing of Hamas, and they opened the door for joint efforts against radicalism. <clears throat> now, I'm talking about concrete collaboration that I'm familiar with. Now, that started this uh, sort of collaboration following the Abraham Accords. When I say this, I'm, I'm talking about grassroots collaboration between American or Canadian Arab Muslim communities and Jewish communities that what binds them together are many things, but there's also a hidden agenda. Usually behind the uh, Muslim forces that are collaborating with, the, with the, uh, the Jewish community, there's an aversion towards Islamism towards those organizations that pretend to represent the entire Muslim community, organizations that are ideologically affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. The fifth opportunity that I see, and, uh, and you know what, this is the most important, is the surge of Jewish solidarity. Um, I think that it's the most important. Jews who are unable to agree on what is the definition, the mere definition of anti-Semitism when it came from the left. Now, increasingly, we can. The strong displays of solidarity with Israel during the conflict could enable significant partnership. We may not reach a, you know, a consensus. We're too polarized for that. But I believe that we, today we are able to build broader coalitions than before uh, and to present largely a united Jewish voice against anti-Semitism, something that surprisingly we were unable to do uh, that, thus far. Now, these openings provide opportunities to reshape the discourse uh, and more effectively fight uh, anti-Semitism. Um, I don't like to propose action items from Israel to you, Americans and Canadians. You should know better. You are much more nuanced politically and, and culturally. You have a, a much more convincing accent than I do, but because it comes up in every conversation. So I'm, I just want to give you few examples of possible action items that could be derived from these uh, insights. And uh, clearly, th these are just uh, to, to spark the conversation. So based on the opportunities uh, we've identified to combat anti-Semitism, here are five examples uh, on how these insights could be transformed into actionable activities for an action plan or an action plan. The first is this is an opportunity to create frameworks that engage rewoken progressives, namely progressives that are woke from the woke, okay? That understand that the, the woke culture uh, is, uh, is, uh, is wrong. Progressive individuals who have reevaluated re the stance on Hamas and Israel following the events of October 7th. There are many of them. And, and I think that we should uh, uh, try to seize this opportunity because we know that the best advocates against Progressive frameworks or progressives that uh, find this, uh, that, that, have, that reject this, uh, these frameworks. They will be much more convincing than anyone comes from uh, the right or even the center. The second is create a campaign and action plan against the Jewish erasure. As I said, the framing of Jews as whites was not perceived up until recently as a challenge to the, in the Jewish community. The Jewish community was playing within the framework that was created to us by others. So we were reaching out to minorities as a privileged minority. And that perpetuated uh, some stigmas uh, about uh, the Jewish community and, and uh, created all sorts of challenges to uh, not only to the Jewish community, but as, I, as I've already mentioned, also to Israel framing it as a, as a colonial state. <clears throat> the third example, I think it is the time to double down on building interface alliances. Now, I know that I'm not saying anything new. That has been done before. Nothing new. But now the time is ripe for mobilization, more than before. And uh, so, so my recommendation is double down on that because the likely effect will be far greater. The fourth is step on Jewish solidarity, try to build diverse Jewish coalitions. Again, that has been done before. Nothing new. With limited success, we have to admit. 
but now the time may be ripe. Uh, in one of uh, the posts that we sent out in our newsletter, we said we said that that was for us, you know, an, an insight for you. Maybe it'll be a uh, common knowledge. We previously thought of October seventh as an Israeli trauma, and therefore we were very happy to uh, to to get the the hug from the Jewish community, which was as in our eyes was comforting us, offering us uh, support and help. We now understand that October 11th was the Pearl Harbor of the Jewish people in its entirety, because that has shaken your social status, your, your status, your, you know, your, your, the, the way of Jewish life in, uh, in uh, North America. Clearly, the threat to your community is different from ours. But this is a threat to the entire Jewish world. And uh, so we can build on better relations between Israel and, and world Jewry. We know that we have been taking different directions in many places, especially southern to the border in America. Uh, many communities disattached from Israel. Now it's time to reheal and to build uh, a stronger framework of uh, what we call peoplehood. <clears throat> Finally, um, the Jewish community must be at the forefront of those opposing critical race theory. It is the order of the day of the Jewish people to fight its consequential uh, lies and prejudice. This commitment to truth and justice is not just a defense of the Jewish community, but as a stand for the universal values in an era of increased fake news and ideological bias. It is our contemporary mission uh, as a people. I, by the way, have changed my mind uh, in this regard. I had a debate that with uh, David Bernstein from the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. At the time, two years ago, I said that we should focus on the Jewish erasure. And he said, no, we should go for the critical race theory in its entirety. For an Israeli to admit that I was wrong is not a very common, but here you are, an Israeli admits that he was wrong. I think that the critical race theory in, in, in its entirety generates for us uh, as a people challenges and, is, it, and there's a direct correlation between the current discourse and the rise of anti-Semitism. I prefer to stop now and maybe to answer some of the questions. I was not looking at the chat because that would have been a distraction, but now let me know how you want to, to play this out. Okay, thank you so much, Aaron. You actually hit on a number of things I wanted to ask and, uh, and a segue from your last comment, which is very important. CEF has been saying for some time that CRT is a serious problem. What I noticed um, and, and maybe you've seen it, is a lot of att attempts to accommodate the Jewish experience within it rather than abandon it entirely. I'm seeing, and we've been part of discussions on how to make DEI, for example, which counters every kind of, uh, of hate, but anti-Semitism, how to educate the DEI folks to do more about anti-Semitism rather than challenge the whole industry. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. I personally, and I think for speaking of our board and many of our supporters believe that CRT is damaging to everyone. And we do talk to people in the Hindu community and the Chinese community, and they too resent CRT. They are now what is called white adjacent. So right. they too experience it as a prejudiced, discriminatory approach. How would we go about trying to, cut, to undercut something that's so pervasive? Um. Can, can you focus the question? CRT is in our schools. Right. It's, it's, uh, assume, it's now pl uh, some political uh, resolutions, actual governmental resolutions include it. The universities are all running on CRT in every course. From I'm, I'm seeing it in mathematics. It's unbelievable. How would you go about trying to remove this? So I, th I think... Um, uh, Critical race theory seemed as another political legitimate stance. And I believe that now people increasingly understand that the critical race theory is in fact, and this is the most important thing, is a threat not only to the Jewish people, but a threat to Western democracies, because it's a threat to meritocracy. Because by applying DEI policies, then the excellence of uh, not the excellence, but the uh, the uh, the society becomes politically biased, and, uh, and and clearly that comes on the uh, on the expense of the protection of the Jewish people. Yes, it says that any achievement that you've 
um, made might be undermined or irrelevant if you're a person of light skin. That's right. And this very simplistic, again, the first thing that we should say is that uh, white does not equal uh, uh, evil. So we should reject this framework to, uh, to start with. But even if this framework is adopted, clearly the Jewish community, Jews are not white because white is, uh, is, is a very, uh, what's the word, is a very uh, loaded concept. It's not neutral. The term white, when it's used in the concept, refers to a social phenomena by which Jews suffered. Yes. Because it, so, so again, we should, we should reject this uh, framework of oppressed and oppressors. But clearly, such frameworks, to be very specifically, fails to capture the Jewish experience. So this is why we should stand as a people and uh, counter CRT. Again, we're coming from a Jewish perspective, but this is a service that we do for uh, right. uh, right. a society that is based on meritocracy. meritocracy. For, the, for the audience, I would point out that there's an organization called FAIR, F-A-I-R, that operates across the educational system in the U.S., a parent organization, and it's now in Canada that does wish to fight against CRT at all levels in the in education. So we'll we'll tell people more about that later. Um, I, I would just add that the aversion yes. of many Jewish groups to counter CRT is because CRT was perceived as a political agenda. And we don't want to and we don't want to have anything with uh, with politics, right? But 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 this is more than a political threat. This there's something intrinsically immoral and illiberal in this uh, seemingly liberal framework. And it is interesting how governments have adopted it also. I've been looking at the anti-racism site of the federal government, and it speaks heavily about DEI, not about equality of opportunity, but about equity of outcomes. And you qualify for funds only if you're really fighting a situ uh, any situation discrimination from the basis of color. That's right. right. So anti-Semitism isn't even listed as a major concern for funding right. here in the anti-racism directorate. Um, you talked a lot about how progressives align, fall ultimately in line with Hamas. But right. are you also um, of the opinion that a lot of young people have no idea what it is that they're aligning with, that there's just huge ignorance? It's sort of go along to get along kind of stuff, join the loudest crowd. We know from surveys that when you ask the kids, many university kids, which river, which sea, they have no idea. Um, and so do you think that a lot of this is just shallow um, antics or that there's some real depth to their hatred? It's not, it's, it's not just hatred and it's not just about ignorance. Clearly, ignorance play a major role. They don't have any clue about which river, which, which sea. Uh, but we are in this very strange uh, era where even when facts are brought you know, in front of their eyes, sometimes they, they, they somehow look away. When you come out with facts, you're still unable to throw your, um, uh, you, you, you know, your, your camp. Uh, the, the word is Tevatehuda. Um, Any Hebrew speakers? <laughs> um, anyways, so... so Remind me, the, remind the question again. The question was about how much is ignorance as opposed to real hatred. So it's more ignorance. It's a, it's a mindset. Even when facts are being brought to the table, right. it will never, even following what Hamas did, Hamas is perceived as a freedom fighter organization. And even if, you know, such atrocities happen, clearly the blame is on Israel. Mm. And this is something which is very, very difficult to fight. And this is why critical race theory is so important because the framework are very rigid and we are unable to break them through. Again, I think that on October 7th, there are also now many opportunities we could exploit. Primarily the fact that we are now able to speak in, broad, in broader Jewish coalitions against anti-Semitism. Again, it's unbelievable that up until recently, Jewish communities were unable to agree on a on a agreed definition to what anti-Semitism is, as long as it comes from uh, from the left. Few Jews, one look at a certain activity and frames it as anti-Semitism; the other is a very much desired social justice act. Now, this still exists, but now, following the shock, the Pearl Harbor of the Jewish people on October seventh. I think that we will be able to build a much broader and much more effective uh, coalitions. 
again, the situation is bad, is tragic, but I'm quite optimistic because I think that those changes are not short term. And when we will be able to bail us out from this current situation, and I'm not even you know, talking about the social polarization in Israel, which of course uh, fed all that. Continues as well. Yeah. Um, you, uh, before I go to the, um, the Q&A, you mentioned the role of Qatar, Qatar, which mm -hmm. has until recently been ignored, though I think it's been pretty obvious to some of us for some time because Al Jazeera is so po poisoned. But uh, now we're saying that there's funding. Is Qatar also the source of the propaganda? One of the things we've noticed is that when a rally is called here, supposedly pro-Palestinian, the same theme is going out across the country. There's some central hub somewhere that seems to be driving the messaging, funding campaigns simultaneously in 10 provinces and probably across the globe. Where is the origin of all of this propaganda? Is there? It's like there's got to be a cabal somewhere that's coordinating it. It happens rapidly overnight, and we don't know where it's coming from. So first of all, there's no headquarters to, to hate, and there's no headquarters to those campaigns. Clearly, there are a few entities or organizations that punch above their weight and play a critical role in, those, uh, in this storm of campaigns, but there's no one place where it is uh, being decided. Qatar plays a very, is, is a very important hub of, of anti-Israeli sentiment all across Europe and North America as well. Qatar is known to be an Islamist uh, state, a, a supportive of, uh, of Hamas. It it's also have amicable uh, relationship with, uh, with Iran. And in practice, and this is something that we at Atchalta are uh, uh, now writing about, progressive movements and Islamist organizations in North America have become the strategic career, the strategic bastion of Hamas and its war in Israel, which translates into increasing pressure on the U.S. administration to cut its ties with, uh, with Israel and reach a ceasefire long before the objectives of the goal were, were achieved. Ha Qatar is behind of those efforts. It also behind the effort, you know, financing universities and promoting this framework of CRT from being a marginal academic theory to almost a mainstream. Right. Well, they must have been after the uh, Canadian government because they succeeded in getting Canada to vote against Israel at the UN. And I think you you commented on that before this program began. You noticed that, right? Right, right. So, so again, I'm not sure about the dynamics in in Canada. More, uh, more of what's what's happening uh, southern to uh, uh, to to your border. But in both cases, there's a very heavy Qatar influence. Uh, also in Europe, they are buying the seat uh, uh, around the table. Um, and, 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 and the result is that because Islamists are partnering with progressive groups and are sympathizers of Hamas and Qatar, Iran benefits of the, of the, uh, of the doubt. There's no other country in the Middle East that is more criticized than Israel in the Middle East. Now, we, we know that the Middle East is not a very sympathetic neighborhood, especially progressive movements com almost completely ignorant. I don't know why I say almost ignore, ignore completely Iran. Right. <clears throat> and, and, you know, other states are not bastions of human rights uh, as well. For them, it's more important to uh, undermine Israel. Qatar through Al Jazeera very much dictates the narrative among the Red Green Alliance. It's like Hamas has this international media uh, to its disposal. This is uh, this is how it uh, this is how it plays out. So cutting this is uh, in, in a paper that we've uh, published and sent to the government. <coughs> we said that Hamas is not is not a state, and in order to make sure that we topple Hamas, we need to more accu accurately define what it means to topple Hamas. Hamas, for example, does not lost effective uh, territory, but did not even try to defend uh, the territory. It very much invited the invasion of uh, yeah. of Israel. It was not trying to sabotage this. That's not what a state does. It was not uh, looking for the welfare of the Palestinians. Not at all. If, if, you know, publicly they state this is not our responsibility. This is the responsibility of Israel and the UN. Yeah. They were not even trying to seize monopoly over the use of power in their territory. Quite the contrary. They 
encourage the Islamic Jihad and other uh, Islamic uh, factions to rearm in, because they knew that the main enemy is, uh, is Israel and creating this uh, <clears throat> decentralized elements actually plays them because they cannot really control the, uh, the territory. They, the Hamas assets, assets are and have been the ability to connect within the organization, not to control the entire territory, but to control its own organization, to make sure that no other organization challenges its uh, supremacy, <clears throat> to be able to conduct foreign relations, right, through Qatar, Egypt, Russia, and so on and, and, and so forth, to connect to the Iranian axis. This, these are something that, these are things that are less relevant to you as a uh, world jury, but there are two other assets that are very important. One is international challenge, Al Jazeera, that also is being aired in America and elsewhere, which is a propaganda tool for Hamas. And the second, and now I, uh, you know, uh, come back to where I started. The other asset is the linkage between progressive movements and Islamists that turn into the strategic depth of Hamas in this fight. And if we want to fight Hamas, if we want to topple the regime, we have to take care of all six of these parameters. This is why our message to the government of Israel, clearly there are a few things that you cannot do on foreign soil, but this is something you should look and encourage through diplomatic efforts, through supporting uh, Jewish uh, local organizations to uh, to focus them on this uh, very challenge. Thanks. One of the questions here is about open borders and um, immigration. Can you right. um, add any comments about how I know in the US they were swarmed with hundreds of thousands of individuals coming across the borders, L a little less so in Canada, but we've also had, I think, un a lot of unvetted immigration, which may contrib have contributed to the people who are actually out on the streets protesting. Do you have any sense of that? You know, I, I feel that this is an issue which uh, you know, I, I should have my my uh, strong mind on because uh, th this is really really a, a, an intrinsically Canadian and American uh, problem. I would say that I will only say that if you look at Europe, you see that not controlling uh, immigration to some extent does create social problems, and I say it you know without any relations to Israel or uh, or to our current situation. Um, clearly, you know the cultural balance in Europe has been has been uh, been out of balance. Uh, but other than that, you know, this is uh, there are a few things that are your problems. We have okay. our own. We have that's true. We have that one. We have um, plenty. We're familiar um, at CAF with the Global Imams Council and have had webinars with their vice chair, who's been quite wonderful, Imad. Imam Mohammed Tahwidi, do you see a role that could be played more uh, globally by that council, the Global Imams Council as a partner? I haven't heard them speak. I haven't seen any statements emanating from the council itself. I very much uh, think that, uh, first of all, you know, engaging with, uh, with this uh, entity is, is not new. This, this organization has played a very positive uh, role. And uh, of course, that uh, when in such dire times, uh, there are also you know, a lot of challenges to these kinds of organization. But if you ask me what could really turn the table on Islamism mm -hmm. is the engagement with these kinds of organizations. And, and the reason is that Muslim communities in North America are not like Jewish communities. Jewish communities are very much organized. We have, uh, you have your federation system, you have uh, many organizations that, you know, in terms of finance and structure and efficiency and lobby, minorities look at uh, the Jewish community with, uh, with admiration. The Muslim community is far less organized. The only, almost the only organized element within Muslim communities, Muslim immigrant communities would be Islamists, usually organizations that are affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. So, you know, my experience, based on my experience, I've met many moderate Muslim leaders who are willing to engage in, in uh, Jewish communities and fight extremism, including uh, Islamism. The problem is that largely they were lone wolves. They, they, had, they, they were unplugged, unplugged to resources, <clears throat> unplugged to organizations. And I think that 
if the Jewish community could empower those uh, those leaders and definitely build relationship with existing bodies like the one that you've mentioned, we will be able to create strong coalitions that will uh, push back because all the signs show and what I'm saying is complete speculation. I cannot back my current uh, statement, but I wouldn't be surprised if the large majority of Muslims in North America don't disapprove Islamist organizations that pretend to speak on, its, on their behalf. I will be very surprised if the results will show otherwise. The problem is that there's no, co uh, no, no opposition. Now, there's a limit to what the Jewish community can do, right? We don't want to get into orientalistic framework and but we definitely can empower authentic leadership and work with existing organizations. Thank you. Um, can you comment on the uh, Palestinian Authority's role? Because for so many years, people referred to the PA as the moderate uh, Muslim, moderate Arab voice, but that's certainly not what I'm seeing. I've seen too many um, statements made by the PA and particularly Abbas in support of Hamas. Uh, and we're hearing that the, that the Biden administration is almost insisting that Gaza be turned over to the PA, which sounds to me like a, a call for death <laughs> that would right. really wipe out Israel. The Palestinian Authority is far from being a supporter of Israel, to say the least. Currently, its uh, conduct is very disturbing. Its leaders are uh, supporting publicly the Hamas massacre. They're even proud that some Fatah factions took... Uh, took part in that uh, program on October 7th. They pay uh, salaries to families of terrorists who committed uh, terror attacks. <clears throat> Their uh, curriculum in schools is full of uh, hatred and uh, anti-Semitism, and I can uh, go on and on. Um, I think that hand, handing now the Gaza, or oh, not now, when, when, Hamas, when the Hamas regime is, uh, is, uh, is toppled, to the Palestinian Authority, to the Palestinian, to, to the Palestinian Authority as is, would be a mistake. And uh, even Biden does not say that. We all talk about a revitalized PA. The question is, what is a revitalized PA? And my position is that first, Israel should control the territory until a revised, a revitalized Palestinian uh, Authority meets certain criteria. For example, and, and by the way, in every scenario that I see, and I know that what, uh, what, I, what I'm going to say is not the opinion of the administration who may oppose it, but I don't see any other way. There will be a compromise on the Palestinian democracy. There will be a compromise on the ability of the Palestinians to decide for themselves. Because if you allow the Palestinians a complete democracy, Hamas could be re-elected. Have we gone so far to allow this? Of course not. So there will be some elements that are currently considered attributes of statehood of the Palestinian Authority that must be internationalized, namely internationally supervised. So this is a, a curriculum in schools. This is um, media. They use their uh, you know, uh, communication uh, media like TV and, 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 and other social uh, networks to, uh, to undermine uh, Israel. That cannot be allowed. There will have to be some kind of mechanism that will uh, oversee the budget to make sure that families of terrorists are not being funded. Uh, there will be a limit on the maneuverability of the PA in international forums because currently they are taking us to hug. Okay. There will be, there must be a monopoly over the use of force, over the use of force to Israel. Namely, every weapon which is not a poli you know, police weapon. They don't need the AK-47. I, I don't understand why, <clears throat> why they, you know, the, their ammunition and their uh, the weapons are that of, of, of an army to the, to, to the Palestinian police. So when this criteria is met, then it'll be time to hand over the Palestinian authority, the Gaza Strip to Hamas, because Israel does not really want to control uh, 2 million Palestinians. It's not good for us. <clears throat> and the way to do it is to make sure that our... Uh, Gaza, of course, demilitarized, I didn't say it, but this is, of course, obvious. Uh, but only when this criteria is met, uh, such, uh, such a transition could be discussed. Well, I think we're all aware that the curriculum that 
is used by um, those in, Gaza, in Hamas and Gaza, is the same curriculum that the PA uses and endorses, and it's delivered by UNRWA. <clears throat> Supposedly, it's an educational curriculum that would be recognized uh, by the UN itself. And, and in fact, it's exactly the opposite. It does not teach coexistence. It teaches violence and the elimination of Israel, and it encourages all the children to learn how to become murderers uh, in the name of being a martyr. So could Israel literally take over and control the educational system in the media, which would have to include Judea and Samaria as well, not just in Gaza? That won't be the right thing to do. There's there's a limit to what uh, Israel should uh, should do because uh, I, I don't even think I need to explain why. But I think that this is an opportunity to leverage the Abraham Accords and the partnership that Israel was able to uh, create in the past uh, few years. I make a distinction between two types of attributes of statehood. Everything which is not security related should be internationalized in a way which allocates a very important role to the Abraham Accords countries and perhaps Egypt. I think that for many reasons, Jordan probably won't agree to, to take part in that, but, but definitely the United Arab Emirates and Saudi. I don't think that talking about an international Arab force in Gaza is realistic. I don't think they will want everyone who, you know, who say this, I don't think understand uh, our politics. But to internationalize their education system or the media, this is something which they can do. The monopoly over the, of the, of the use of thought must be in the hands of Israel, which we cannot control on any other international uh, force that will do it for us, or otherwise we will face a very similar reality to what we are now facing in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, I just remind you that following the second Lebanon war, Unifil was deployed in Lebanon, and we now know that uh, you know, Hezbollah, when it wanted, just pushed away Unifil, so we don't want to get uh, back to that uh, scenario. No, and we don't want the international community to say UNRWA is the international body that should deliver education because that's exactly what they're doing. I think that this is an excellent opportunity to dismantle UNRWA, which would which uh, should have been done uh, long before. Uh, and by the way, you know, I, I mentioned the uh, all the limits on the PA. Clearly, the, the the Palestinians will eventually need to be part partner to that kind of arrangement. So other than the limits that I've mentioned, I think that the carrot to the Palestinians could be in the form of uh, allowing them uh, to develop attributes of statehood in several aspects that they have thus far were prevented to, primarily economic. We, we shouldn't care if the Palestinians would have their own currency or their own uh, custom envelope. Uh, and there are certain of other issues which are not security related and are not conscious related uh, which Israel could uh, could do so that will be a balancing act um, that uh, could potentially make uh, some kind of uh, arrangement permanent and stable there was a question sent in I'm not sure if uh, that I um, completely understand that suggested that Netanyahu had allegedly supported Hamas to <coughs> undergo the PA I'm not aware if that's true, maybe you could comment because the question is, would that have, to what extent would that have affected the propaganda of Hamas and advanced its agenda? I think that the second part of the question is uh, is uh, is more politically biased. I mean, everyone see what what it wants, but but clearly, uh, this is not a secret, um, and it was set out bluntly by by Netanyahu at the time. What Netanyahu wanted is to strengthen Hamas over the PA in order to avoid the political process. But what, he, what Netanyahu was aiming at, at uh, making Hamas not too strong, to strengthen him, but not to make it too strong. <clears throat> that, it's, it, it's a fact. No, no one actually denies, uh, denies uh, this fact. The, where, where is the uh, political debate in Israel? Because you know that up until October 6, there were a few other things that uh, preoccupied us, yeah. which uh, seemed to be existential. And they were, but, uh, but now they look like uh, we are actually missing those days. We, we're not, but I don't think that we will go back very quickly to the days of social polarization that, uh, 
that existed in the first part of the 2023. I don't think that the political reform in its entirety will go back on the table. But I do think that the next social and political rift will relate to the day after. Because everyone in Israel, supporters of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, opponents of Benjamin Netanyahu, everyone agrees that the Israeli mindset, the conceptual framework has failed. There's a rare consensus. However, if you dig down and you'll ask, which conceptual framework fail, then you will see the two camps are stating two different things. <clears throat> Those on the left, center of left, are saying, clearly the conceptual framework that uh, collapsed was that of Netanyahu that uh, strengthened Hamas over the Palestinian Authority. We got October 7th because of that policy. The, cent the center and right of center would say, no, what collapsed is the notion of Palestinian sovereignty. It doesn't really matter if it's Hamas or the PA, because you see that how Hamas supports uh, terrorists. I mean, so currently publicly, but and also with money. So, so we, we are going to, so I, I think that this disagreement, this fundamental disagreement is going to be the next point of clash, politi political and social clash, uh, in Israel. And I'm very much concerned by this day because uh, as days go through, we are, I, I see the return of sectorial politics and statements and so also little politics as if the war is over. The war is not over. Social cohesion is still very much needed, also in times of routine, but definitely in, time, in, in this time of war. And I hope that uh, decision makers in Israel and Israeli leaders will uh, be a little bit more responsible in this regard. There are other additional questions, which I will send to you afterwards, Aaron. I think what I'd like to ask you to do now, just as a wrap up, is to say a little bit more about a startup, which I thought was interesting when I read about your new organization and the phrase that you use to describe your mission. Perhaps you could tell people about what you mean by that mission. Sure. So as a starter is a thalta in Hebrew. A thalta in Hebrew is commencement or start. Um, is a non-partisan, proudly Zionist uh, leadership uh, SWAT team. Uh, we strive to be the gatekeepers of social cohesion and national resilience in Israel. Um, we employ innovative methodology and technology. When I say technology, I refer to artificial intelligence and mind mapping. And we work to expand knowledge and drive collective action using a very unique ecosystem approach. So if you want, I, we are a think and do tank. We create the frameworks, and then we are committed to generate uh, change. Uh, by the way, I encourage everyone to visit our website at halta.com, A-T-C-H-A-L-T-A dot, uh, dot com. At Halta was born because and on the background of the social polarization in Israel. It was established very recently and practically starting to work in July. At the time, as I said, the most uh, prominent challenge that we were facing was the social uh, polarization. We in Atalta understood that a lot of this tension is attributed to the political system in Israel, which is very, very centralized, more centralized than any other government at the OECD. And why is this important? Because every small tension between the different sectors in the Israeli society quickly escalated to the national level and became a national crisis. So just an illustration, the last government, that of Bennett and Lapid, imploded eventually. What started the snow, snowball for its implosion was a marginal, unimportant law, the Levin law, Choka Hametz, right? Which allowed hospitals to check the bags of visitors during Passover to see, to make sure that they don't bring in bread. And I can give you more ridiculous uh, examples of how minor issues quickly escalated and became uh, and, sh and shook the political and social system in Israel. So what we were the we understood that by empowering local leadership and de the decentralization of powers, we will be able to create a society which uh, is not as characterized by social by tribalism and and sectorialism. However, we also realized that the Israeli political system is very weak. Very weak in times of routine, and add to that the tension over the judicial reform, and you 
and, and you get an incapable, impotent political system. So we were developing a model that was to empower local leadership without a significant judicial reform. And uh, in order to compensate for the lack of, con of constitutional legal reform, uh, we thought uh, we allocated a very important role to world jury, uh, that which was very much integrated in our model. And the first reason is that, uh, you know, in the Jewish state, in the nation state of the Jewish people, right, that realizes the right of self-determination of the Jewish people, we are now pivoting. We are talking about the new worlds of the game. Guess who's, who's absent around the table? World Jewry. And we said, as a moral statement, Jews around the world should be around the table when we talk about the new Israel. Second is more, you know, utility. I'm an Israeli in a, in a very, uh, um, you know, I'm secular, near off Tel Aviv, Ramad Gan. I, I didn't go out public before the war, but I knew that once I will, it doesn't matter if I will try to convince that I speak from an all-Israel perspective. I, I would have been categorized as a liberal, secular Tel Avivian. And my ability to, pro, to promote this framework would have been limited. However, world jury are not subject in the same, to the same powers of categorization in Israel. So when they initiate, the prospects of success are far bigger. And you know that the Jewish world is already working in, in some kind of a regional uh, structure through the Shutfuyot, the, the partnership between every federation, 75 federations and, and uh, local uh, powers. And we know that uh, following this famous uh, President Rivlin speech on the four, four tribes of the Israeli society, a lot, there was a repurposing of a lot of uh, philanthropic uh, funding to that. So the world, world jury was very well positioned uh, to lead on this issue. I was, we were preparing a pilot in the Western Negev uh, with uh, several Jewish organizations and several local organizations. And uh, half an hour to October 7th, I understood we need to pivot because clearly the pilot in the Western Negev was, was unlikely. So currently we are focusing on supporting decision-making in Israel uh, in, in policy vis-a-vis -vis Hamas and vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian threat, which we believe is you know the 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 root uh, the root of most of our challenges and uh, security challenges in Israel, and second is to do what we can in order to support Jewish communities to fight anti-Semitism. Not only because we really love you and care uh, for you, but because, as I uh, was trying to uh, to state, we think it's also a national security threat to Israel itself. Thank you. I'm really glad that you did take the time to explain your organization. I want to encourage everybody to sign up for your newsletter, which I've been receiving, I guess, for some time. And I'm so happy that we made the connection personally, Iran. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the explanations, which were very, very well articulated and for all the wonderful work you're doing. And thank you to all of our program sponsors today and for all of you for attending. I will be forwarding questions. I see, for example, we need to get from um, Iran um, proper data on Qatar's funding, so I'll follow up with that. And thanks everyone for being here. Chag Sameach, enjoy the last Andrea, one final word, if, if I may. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. That has been an honor. Uh, second, please send me those questions and I will, as much as I can, translate, will communicate the answers in, in my newsletter. That would be a great way to, uh, so please sign up to our newsletter and you will be able to see the responses. Thank I you so much. That very much. Thanks, everyone, and take care, be safe. And thanks again to all of our wonderful sponsors that really have reached out to us from all over North America.